Welcome to the inaugural uh, Greenhouse Demo Day 2021. And thank you so much to those of you joining us here in person and those of you joining us virtually too. Uh, I'm Raya El Salahi. I'm going to be your host for today's event and really pleased to be joining you for the first in a new series of Demo Days here at the Centre for Climate Change Innovation. Now, this is a really exciting moment in the greenhouse uh, journey. The successor to the Climate KIC Accelerator, the new greenhouse programme kicked off amid turbulent times at the start of this year in January 2021. It's part of the new Centre for Climate Change Initiative. And the pictures that you are going to see today form part of the first intake of startups. So we have a really, really exciting uh, range of startups for you to hear from today, throughout this afternoon. Uh, fascinating speakers to join you in just a moment too. And just to give you an idea of how the event will run this afternoon, will be split into three separate sections uh, with guest speakers at the start of each, followed by four startup pitches in each. Uh, we'll have two breaks to give you the chance not just to stretch your legs but also to interact uh, with other guests and the aim is to wrap up about half past four giving you enough time to network afterwards until around half past five. Uh, before we start, just a few brief housekeeping points to share. There are no planned fire alarms, so if you hear one go off, it is the real thing. Uh, fire evacuation points are clearly marked uh, throughout the building. There are also fire wardens on hand uh, among the RI staff in the building to guide you uh, to a safe place. The event, uh, in the event of an evacuation, uh, we just ask that you make your way out quickly and safely. Uh, there will be fire wardens directing you to the gathering point, which is on Grafton Street. Uh, also, first aiders are on hand in the building. If you uh, need help, please just do let yourself know to any of the team, uh, let, let any of the team know, rather. Uh, from a COVID-19 perspective, uh, the number of tickets available for today's event has been restricted to allow for more space and flexibility in the venue. Uh, you have already pretty uh, well spread yourselves out, but if you do feel the need to spread yourself out a little bit more, please feel free. Uh, we do ask that you wear a mask whilst you're in the lecture theatre. Uh, you should have been offered a, a coloured sticker on your entry into the space. Uh, just as a reminder, if anyone is wearing a red sticker, that means that they uh, don't want to uh, get too close to maintain social distancing uh, and minimise contact. An amber sticker uh, means the wearer is mostly happy with social interaction, so would prefer perhaps an elbow bump to a handshake. Uh, and a green sticker means that the wearer is uh, fully happy to interact. Uh, please know that the breaks uh, and networking sessions outside of this space, outside of the lecture theatre, uh, masks are not essential, but we do ask that you use your own discretion, of course, when engaging with others in those areas. Uh, the startups will also be allocated uh, standing tables, uh, so hopefully these should be pretty easy to find. But if there is a picture that you uh, particularly would like to speak to and you can't find them, just ask a member of the CCCI team uh, who will also be walking around to help. Right. That's enough of all the housekeeping points. Really, really pleased to kick things off today with our first speaker of the day, HSBC's Head of Corporate Sustainability, Michaela Wright, with insight into the importance of innovation for tackling climate change and why HSBC has decided to support the CCCI's work on the greenhouse. Uh, please put your hands together and welcome Michaela Wright. Hear me okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm a loud Yorkshire person, so hopefully that will be fine. So, just um, thank you, Raya, for that introduction, and good afternoon. And just such a pleasure to be in such an amazing venue. And I, I think, for what I'm not, I think, I know will be an, an inspiring day as well. Um, so, I'm looking forward to hearing from the ventures, but I thought it would be really good to just um, give a bit of insight into why we're supporting this program with Imperial and our commitments as well to net zero. Um, I think it's hard to avoid the fact that just a few weeks ago we had COP26. And um, so I think this event is really quite timely. Um, it was intense, I'm, I'm sure anybody watching watching the media, and, and really mixed responses to, to how that closed out. You know, there, there was lots of headlines, modest progress maybe, um, imperfect, least worst deal, um, but no doubt that will put even more pressure, certainly on the private sector, to start taking action as well. 
And I did feel during COP there was this optimistic sort of pathway about potentially 1.8 degrees that the International um, Energy Agency came out with. And then when we finished recent reports, we all know are saying 2.4. And we know that doesn't get us close enough. Um, and I think what was really clear to me, and, and this is why days like today are so important, is that uh, what really came out of COP is that partnerships and working together is so important. And that is, you know, governments as well as the private sector and organisations like HSBC, and we have a huge role to play. And, and that is all in that hope that we... we get to that well below two degrees that I'm sure you're all more than aware of. And I think we're all really more hopeful that it's the 1.5. So what are we actually doing? I'm just gonna just really briefly touch on a couple of areas of our strategy, but also where that links to innovation. And so we announced our, our net zero commitments in October, 2020. And in, in recognition as a large global bank, the role we we have to play, and that's broken down into three areas. So customers, you can imagine what our customers are going through now from the large corporates to the small businesses, wondering where to even start with some of this. So supporting our customers is, is absolutely crucial. We've committed to $1 trillion in the next 10 years in sustainable finance and, and investment. And I'm really pleased to say that since January, um, we have $87 billion already towards that target we and I'm, I'm sure you, you you've seen the press we we know that reliance on coal really needs to stop and needs to stop urgently and and HSBC will not we will not finance any new coal fire power stations or new thermal coal mines and we've made a commitment to exit any existing financing by 2030 in OECD and EU, and then 2040 in other markets. So, and, and I, I, the second part of our strategy, which I think is really, really important, is creating common standards and frameworks. So I'm sure most of you, if you are grappling with anything in the ESG space, working out where to invest is something really green. Um, and having those common standards are absolutely key to unlocking the finance that's required. So our, our global CEO, Noel, Noel Quinn, is, is chair of the Financial Services Task Force, um, which is part of the Sustainable Markets Initiatives. And, and that is working with 11 other banks to help create those, those common standards and, and measure sustainable finance and make sure it really it really is sustainable finance. And then we're also founding members of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which is a group of 58 banks from 29 countries. And that will really bring the sort of urgency and collaboration around this. I just realized I moved my mic away. Sorry. The third part, and this is what today is all about. So it's really about scaling up new technologies. So we know to tackle climate change, yes, you need the finance. Yes, we need regulation. Yes, we need policies from government. But we also need those, those new technologies. So in addition to our climate solutions program, which I'll talk about, we, we've launched a couple of other initiatives. So we know there'll be a new asset class around nature. So we've committed um, to supporting that through our climate asset management arm, and that's working with Pollination, um, who I'm really pleased are part of the um, Centre for Climate Change uh, Innovation here. And that is focused really on, on the protecting and preserving of nature. And then we're also investing $100 million into clean tech. And, and finally, and most importantly, and where we, it connects with this program is our climate solutions program. And that's a $100 million donation to WWF, WRI, and all our local partners, which includes Imperial um, College London and University of Birmingham. 
We know that we have around half of the world's solutions that need to transition to net zero don't exist in that commercially deployable form. And that's the key part of this program for us. So it's using our international networks and helping you, you, you know, as startups. But when, when your business model is ready, using our skills and capabilities to help you scale up interna internationally. And which is why we're pleased to be supporting Imperial and, and these homegrown ventures as we're, as we're here in the UK. And then I'd, I'd just like to, to close on, on a couple of key points. As, a, as an international bank, we, we know that we do need to use that, that reach I, I talked about at, to create that critical mass of climate solutions. We know it won't happen overnight, but we are investing for, for the long term. And, and we also know we can contribute the most as well. So we really want to help and help all of you to scale and grow, and grow your businesses. Um, but more importantly, to have an impact on those temperatures and, and, and you know, keeping them well below that 1.5 that we talked about. So just a thank you um, and uh, for inviting me to, here today. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from some of the climate ventures. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Michaela. That brings us on to our next speaker of the day. I'd like to invite the Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change, also uh, an environment and the Interim Director of the Centre uh, for Climate Change Innovation based right here at the RI, uh, Alyssa Gilbert. Okay, well, thank you, Michaela, for talking about HSBC's generous donation to supporting the greenhouse venture here. I wanted to just speak for a couple of minutes about what our overall program is at the Center for Climate Change Innovation. So the Center for Climate Change Innovation is a joint project between ourselves at Imperial College London and the Royal Institution, where you're sitting now. Now, you can recognize the amazing space that we're in and the history that there is in this venue in producing excellent science and sharing that with the public. And what we're doing is we're combining that with the excellent science and innovation that we bring from Imperial College, as well as many of our other research partners, to try and tackle the urgent climate crisis in front of us. As Michaela pointed out, whilst we have many technologies available to help us tackle the climate crisis, we don't have all the technologies that we need. In addition to that, whilst we have many solutions, we're not yet able to deploy them at scale convince individuals and companies and people to use them where they could already be used as a viable solution. So what we want to do is create a home in London for innovation in all its forms, both small startups and startups that we hope will grow and succeed, but also to create the correct climate, so to speak, for the scale up of ideas that we already have and for innovation in policy ideas. And here we are, very close to a financially rich centre of London, but also close to a policy-making nexus and in a place that does excellent policy engagement. So what we want to achieve at the Centre for Climate Innovation is supporting startups, but using what we learn about their innovation journey to make better policy that can support successful innovation in the climate space at scale. That might be promoting climate policies, but also fixing the innovation journey for those individuals and also sharing with the public, school children, but also adults in this venue and through the activities of the Royal Institution, an understanding of what innovation in climate looks like. What are those technologies? Make them real and tangible, exciting and usable so that we can help tackle the climate change ahead. We know from the Glasgow COP that, that Michaela referred to, one of the outcomes were the Glasgow breakthroughs. In recognition of the need for innovation, the UK government set up partnerships with other governments to try and tackle some of the challenges of climate change with innovation as a solution. And what we want to create here is a centre in London that creates jobs, creates value, creates skills for all of the population, as well as really scaling up and solving the climate change crisis. So, help, so thank you all for joining us here today at our first demo day for our climate innovators who are at the heart of this. They're really the core of our venture. Um, they're the start of this journey. Um, but we hope to have you back at many more network building events and hope to bring you into this growing and really important community in London so that we can grow, flourish, solve a challenge, 
create economic growth for, for London, but also then connect with others in the UK and internationally. So please participate fully today, but connect with us individually about how you can also be part of our center in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, and an innovative way of wearing your mask on your wrist as well, which I think I'm going to have to copy, so I remember to keep wearing it. Uh, almost time to hand over uh, to our uh, pitches today, and you've got a brilliant first session coming. Uh, I'm just going to hand over first to our final speaker of this session, one of the founders of the Greenhouse, and someone who over the past 12 months has worked extremely closely with all of the startups that you'll see and hear from today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Naveed Chowdhury. Hi everyone, um, I'll be very brief, um, just to start off by saying thanks for coming. I know for many of you it's the first in-person event you might have done for, for quite a long time. Um, but it is very, very valuable, it's very inspiring for the startups to actually see an audience and pitch in front of them. Um, as you won't be surprised to know, I think the majority of our startups were actually founded during lockdown. And you know they've been used to pitching online, they've done very well pitching online. Um, but it's also part of the journey and part of the, the experience to actually pitch to a live audience. Get questions, we do encourage you to be, to be interactive. And you know we, we look forward to seeing what's to come. So I'm going to be very brief. I just don't want to hold off the, the startups any longer. Um, but just um, very quickly to talk about the, the program and just to let you know why we're here today. So the Greenhouse, as was, was mentioned at the beginning, was founded at the beginning of this year off the back of a, a, a long legacy of climate change innovation, which Richard will talk about um, later in the, in the event. Um, but we support um, nearly 30 startups a year now. We took cohort one, who you'll be hearing from today in January. 15 startups joined as part of that cohort, 12 of whom you'll be, you'll be hearing from today. Um, and we are a, an entirely equity-free program. So we take startups from the, the very, very early stages. Our motivation is really to build the, the pipeline of climate change innovation um, when it comes to startups and technology, and essentially help them on their journey to success. So we provide them with, with funding, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that briefly as to where that comes from. Um, providing with a lot of support. Um, they've all enjoyed being at the RI, where we're now based and where we have um, great space to, to work from. And there's also a massive collaborative element with the cohorts as well. Um, there's something for those of you who are active in the climate change innovation space, um, you may have seen, but there's uh, a strong spirit that runs through all of the startups in here about a bigger mission that they're all looking to, to solve and actually tackle. And there's, there's a massive benefit to, to have that um, size of cohort have them working in person and have them have them learning from each other. So um, this cohort has done very, very well. You know, they joined us in January, blank sheet of paper in many cases, and in many instances they've already gone on to launch their product. I think there's all, already been almost two million pounds of, of equity fundraised by the cohort. Um, you know, some of them are advancing quickly, some of them are advancing at their, their own pace, and there's a variety of different technologies. Um, one thing which I think you'll all enjoy is everyone's got their own personality. Everyone's got their own pitching style. You're going to see a variety of different styles today, um, which I'm looking forward to, and I uh, hope you are as well. And then I'd just like to end on um, what we've referred to already earlier around, around the support. So as Rare implied, it was quite a turbulent period towards the end of last year. Um, with our program, it was looking like it may have to come to an end, and we secured you know, funding to allow it to continue. And that was um, thanks to HSBC, who we've heard from already, and ERDF, both of whom have supported the, the program financially, as well as the, the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation. And then we've had um, a number of you know, sources of in-kind support. We've had the, the Mayor of London and the GLA. We've had Slaughter and May, who have recently announced a fast-forward support program for a number of our startups. And you know, for any, anyone out there listening, anyone here today um, who wants to support, who wants to get involved, um, you know, we all do it for the benefit of the startups and for the bigger mission of climate change and climate change innovation. So we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Any, any ideas would be welcome. And at the end of the event, there will be uh, an opportunity for you to actually insert your details online on the, the system we're using. If you want to connect with startups, if you want to talk to them about investment, if you simply want to learn more about them, um, we'd be very happy to, to put you in touch. So I will, I will stop there, and um, we'll get going with the, with the startups.
Thank you very much indeed, Naveed. Right, uh, that does bring us on to the first round of Climate Innovators, and each team will deliver a, uh, a pitch presenting their innovation and vision. Uh, and we'd like you here in the audience and watching online to submit questions uh, to the teams using uh, Mentimeter, uh, which you will see on the screen above my head now. Uh, you can access it through your phone, uh, just head to menti.com, and you need to enter the code at the top of the screen that you see there, 12428767, that's one two four two eight seven six seven uh, and you can submit your quest questions at uh, the end of each pitch it's worth just noting that you need to refresh the page so if you uh, aren't seeing what you think you should be seeing just uh, hit refresh after hearing all of the pitches in this section uh, we'd like you to submit a score for each of the teams that you see and we'd like you to do that based on three key areas uh, firstly on their commercial potential uh, secondly on the climate impact of innovation and thirdly and finally, on the quality of the pitch. At the end of today's event, uh, we'll announce the top three highest scoring teams. So please do make sure that you participate through Mentimeter. And as I said, all the details above me there, along with the Wi-Fi code as well. Time now to hand over to the first of a really exciting bunch of innovators you're going to hear from throughout the course of this afternoon. And I'd like to welcome Matt Anderson from Cryogenx, who, along with his team, is developing technology to help us live in a warmer world. So please welcome uh, Matt. The man on the left is Matthew Power. This was taken back in 2014 when he was trekking through Uganda. Two hours after this photo was taken, Matthew was dead. He died from heat stroke following hours of arduous trekking in 40 degree heat. He passed away because he could not receive the medical help to cool his body down. Matthew's story inspired me to develop Cryosuit, the portable body cooling device for heat stroke. Tragically, Matthew's story isn't unique. Right now, all over the world, 495,000 people die every year from extreme heat. And this figure will increase by 257% by 2050, directly due to climate change. But it's not only a huge human loss we'll have to burden. According to the UN, by 2030, heat stress will cost the global economy $2.4 trillion a year in lost work and healthcare bills. This really is an inescapably growing solution that demands a rapid tech-led solution. Heat stroke occurs as a result of prolonged exposure to and physical exertion in hot environments. When your core body temperature reaches 40 degrees, your internal organs begin to shut down. You've got 30 minutes to initiate core body cooling before the risk of death outweighs survival. The most current effective treatment method is a full body ice bath. However, as you can see, the resources required and logistics render this method impossible to implement in almost every scenario. Transportation to medical facilities is required, wasting crucial treatment time and putting people's lives at risk. We're here to change that. Cryosuit is a revolutionary new portable body cooling solution. It is the ice bath in your backpack. Our patent pending technology emulates ice water immersion with less than 2% of the comparative resources. A powerful coolant stored within compact, lightweight canisters is injected into conductive pads, delivering rapid and sustained cooling. Cryosuit is designed to be used across the world's most remote and extreme environments, enabling life-saving cooling to be delivered in any scenario. We've been working with construction, defence, sports and the fire service to ensure we are developing the ultimate solution. UK elite forces are supporting trials of our device alongside occupational medical teams, international institutions and professional athletes. By 2025, we want Cryosuit to be in the hands of every single person at risk from heat stroke. Are you the people to help make our mission a reality? Thank you.
Thank you very much for a brilliant first pitch, Matt, and uh, well done for kicking things off. Um, we are going to ask you to get your questions in, as I mentioned, via menti.com. Um, we had a question in already, and Matt, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what stage of development the technology is currently at. Absolutely. So, um, contrary to the nice shiny visuals in our deck, um, that is the deception of graphic design. We're not quite there yet, unfortunately, but we hope to be soon. We're currently working at half scale functioning prototypes, which are tied into a number of grants, mainly focused towards iterative R&D with, with DASA and Innovate UK, with the, uh, with the idea of reaching a, a full-scale trialable device by next August. Um, so this will allow us to take it to a preclinical research study with partners at Bruno University, um, in which we'll hope to get our first key data set, which proves the efficacy and safety of our device. And following that, we, we hope to gain regulatory approval um, and then pursue encapsulating our beachhead markets within the UK um, and mainly the US. Stuff. And I think I'm right in saying you'll be sticking around. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask you directly, you'll be in the space later on. Yes, I will. Good stuff. Um, we have had a question in just quickly. What competitions are there on the market? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very valid question. And um, there's sort of a number of ways we can, we can address this. In terms of competition for a portable, on-demand, and efficacy core body cooling device, there is nothing. There was a, a British competitor called CareVest, um, and their CEO is, is now working with us as one of their advisors. Uh, but there's, there simply is no current solution that can, that can offer the, the performance and also the operational requirements. All other devices require pre-storage, either in a clinical freezer, or, or require you know, huge onerous batteries and, and control systems, which, as you can see, just, just isn't feasible in some of the situations in which, in which our, our device hopefully is deployed. So we really are hoping to, to encapsulate a brand new market opportunity with our solution. Fantastic stuff. Um, and if we have any other questions, they should pop them up on the screen in just a moment's time. And just a reminder to head on to menti.com and add the code. A question in to ask, how will you make this technology affordable to those who most need it in developing nations where access to healthcare is limited? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very poignant question. I think with our model, when we're pursuing these, these more um, financially gifted markets, should we say, in, in, in defence, construction, in, in industry, the margins we create with this will allow us to have a philanthropic element to our business. And we absolutely want to be able to pursue, uh, you know, making this technology available for these, these, these lesser nations because, unfortunately, these areas of the world where the, the health tech isn't there is the most exacerbated through heat. So, you know, it's a key strategic mission of the business you know, past pure profitability and pure commercialization to be able to supply this technology to the people who need it most. Stuff. Um, and just again, a reminder that you will be sticking around. You'll be able to speak to all of those um, who you hear from pitching today. Uh, another question in, what gave you the idea? What are your founders' backgrounds? So I'm a sole founder, um, if my sense. And uh, the, the, the idea actually came from um, sitting in, in my bedroom at uni watching um, the documentary in which, which Matthew Power was in, and he, he died on camera. Uh, and that sort of really kick-started the idea of thinking, my goodness, how, how can we be in this, this world where someone can die of being too hot? It just it didn't calculate. So um, that, that was really the inception. And then from there, it sort of grew throughout a university project. I studied product design at, at Brunel University. And then pursuing it post that became to realize that it wasn't just encapsulated in this, in this one tragic story. You know, there's there's hundreds of thousands of people that succumb every year and yeah we need to find an answer to this thank you so much and well done on the thank brilliant first pitch thank you, thank you. Okay, that brings us on to uh, the next pitch of the day. Jack Kennedy from uh, Dodo joins us now, who is uh, developing a platform helping companies to uh, measure their emissions and access sustainable loans. So, Jack, over to you. Thank you very much. Over $50 trillion is needed to help small and medium-sized companies to reach net zero. And yet, these SMEs, the powerhouse of this economy, are critically under-supported and underfunded when it comes to this challenge. I'm Jack from Dodo, and today I'm going to share with you the two challenges that these companies face and how we help solve that problem. So 22% plan to use a green loan to reduce their emissions, and yet 50% find it hard to access. So it's hard for SMEs to access the finance that they need. 47% rank CO2 reduction as a very high priority in their business. And yet, incredibly, only 3% of SMEs have measured their emissions. It's hard for these companies to measure their company's carbon footprint. Now, Dodo addresses both of these challenges. We rapidly measure the company's carbon footprint, and we provide sustainable loans to help them to reduce it. So how does that work? 
To start, companies can connect their accounting systems through our platform. And this gives us everything that we need to rapidly calculate their emissions and check their affordability for a loan. Now, using this financial data, alongside a carbon database like Taconomy, we can rapidly calculate the entire company's carbon footprint in literally just a few minutes. We've also integrated with Patch to offer our customers high quality, verified carbon offsets through the platform. However, it's crucial that we help companies to reduce their emissions at the source. And to do that, they need sustainable loans. So using the exact same financial information, we can check a company's affordability for a loan and unlock sustainable loans through our platform. Now, there are three benefits of this to SMEs. One, it's easy to use. In just two clicks, companies can share all the data that they need. Two, it's easy to understand. They can get a view of their entire carbon footprint. And three, it offers a more affordable route to get to net zero through sustainable loans. So at this point, it's probably worth talking about what is a sustainable loan. Well, if a company commits to measuring and reducing their emissions, they can access a lower interest rate on their loan. Why is that important? Well, if we look at the current competitor landscape, we know there's a growing number of B2B carbon accounting tools helping companies to measure their emissions. We also know there's a number of B2B lending companies helping others to access the finance that they need. However, there's a gap in the market. And Dodo is the only tool that helps companies to measure their emissions and therefore unlock sustainable loans through our platform. Now, sustainability lending is a massive market. Globally, it's worth over 360 billion pounds. And in the UK, it's just worth over 2.2 billion alone and grew by 80% last year. And we plan to rapidly expand into this market. Customers can measure the carbon footprint for free and our revenue will be generated from a flat 5% fee for many loans issued through the platform. Today, we're halfway there. And we've built integrations into three of the biggest accounting tools in the UK with coverage of 70%. We've launched our measure tool to help companies measure their emissions. And we have a growing number of paying engaged businesses using our platform. Looking towards the next nine months, we plan to do three things. Expand our integrations to cover 90%, secure our loan partnership, and launch our loans product into the market. And the product that you've seen here today was built by my co-founder, Chaba. He has over 14 years of experience in building and launching data-focused products. I have previous experience in the loans market. I was the first hire at Portify, where we a fintech company that helped over 200,000 users track their finances and access interest-free loans. And our vision is to help 6 million SMEs in the UK to reduce over 40 million tons of CO2 in the next five years. Thank you. Just hang on for some questions, Jack. Brilliant uh, second pitch today. Uh, so please do get your questions in using menti.com. And just to start us off, a uh, question in asking uh, about your target customers today and in the future. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we just targeted industries with a lighter carbon footprint to begin with. So technology, sales, consulting to start and to build out a product. Um, but the bigger area of where we see the biggest market plus the biggest need is customers in, say, the food and the retail um, and more sort of complex carbon markets. So we're looking at that as a, a sort of next area of development into getting up and running for them. Stuff. And if you have a question, please do get it in now. We've had one in uh, which asks, uh, well, firstly, it's, it's great software. <laughs> Could you uh, white label this for the banks to use to increase reach to, for example, HSBC? Yes, absolutely. Um, with HSBC here. Um, <laughs> no, this is, a, this is a great route to market for us. Um, we know that you know, banks, particularly after COP26, uh, you know, $130 trillion worth of assets were committed to net zero. Um, part of that is, you know, they need to know the emissions of their loan portfolio, and that's, you know, tens of thousands of, of SMEs. And so we could potentially help them solve their problem also in getting, you know, bottom-up level uh, calculations for um, their companies and their loan portfolios, SMEs emissions as well. Fantastic stuff. Another question in, does your carbon footprint calculator include upstream uh, supplier carbon impact as well as direct impact? Yeah, so uh, we account for this. We use an input-output model is, is essentially how it works. Um, so we use the financial transactions to convert these into emissions. Um, but we are looking to get a bit more in-depth in that over time to increase the accuracy of our carbon footprint to account for um, upstream and downstream emissions as well. 
Um, please do keep your questions coming in using menti.com. Another one in, you mentioned a 5% uh, loan cost to access lower interest rates. How does this offset the cost? Yeah, so this one's a bit interesting. It depends on um, the supplier of the loan itself. Um, so it, it depends on what they have set up um, and how, what they are actually doing. Um, so sometimes it's a bit different, if I understand the question correctly, it's a bit different, um, the reduction in price that they get from measuring their emissions and accessing that loan, depending on the different supplier. Um, so it's a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Uh, and you will, of course, be sticking around to answer questions yes, in, uh, in the space. Uh, so thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Thomas from Mano Biosystems to pitch a black soldier fly company disrupting uh, the way insects are farmed in the global south through decentralised technology. So, Thomas, welcome. Thank you. So, by 2050, we will need 100 million tonnes more protein per year. With growing populations and rising middle classes, demand for meat is increasing rapidly. Since 1980... Per capita consumption of meat in the developing world has doubled. But our food system is broken. Current methods for addressing this demand are unsustainable and have relied on increasing production of soya and fish meal for animal feed. In the Amazon, 4 million hectares of rainforest are deforested annually for, fish, for, for soya. And in sub-Saharan Africa, 76% of fish species in Lake Victoria are already overfished. So it's clear we need more protein, but we also need better protein. MANA is an insect farming company. We develop technologies to help scale insect farming across the global south, with a particular focus on sub-Saharan Africa. We rear the black soldier fly larvae to replace fish meal and soya in that animal feed. In just 12 days, our larvae can bioconvert organic waste into high quality proteins and fats. And with one third of all food ending up in landfill, mostly not only valuable nutrients, but also the resources used to create that food, insects are a natural solution. They are readily consumed by poultry, fish, swine, and many household pets, and they offer a more natural solution enabling improved animal health and increased productivity. Mana rears the black soldier fly larvae to, to sell the protein to feed millers. And we also lease our turnkey bioconversion bio technology to waste producers. In the last 15 years, prices of soya have doubled and prices of fish meal have trebled. So insect protein is now a rapidly growing market. In Kenya alone, the current unmet demand for insect protein is estimated at 90,000 tonnes per annum. And globally, the market is projected to be worth $8 billion by 2030, offering us a sizable market that we are able to address. But how are we addressing that problem? We have a modular solution which enables insect farmers across the global south to produce in commercially relevant quantities. Our hybrid solution combines centralizing the more difficult breeding and post-processing using state-of-the-art automation, climate control, and counting technology, whilst decentralizing the insect rearing directly on waste producer sites. By focusing on the global south, we can benefit from the more favorable climate conditions, labor costs, and organic waste availability, and it allows us to offer a more scalable and less capex-intensive solution. To date, we have developed our proof of concept at our London Insectarium and Technology Hub, and at our pilot facility in Nairobi, we are starting to actively implement these technologies in the local environment. So we welcome, would, would welcome any questions you may have, but we hope you will come and join us on our inset revolution. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and once again, a reminder that you can get your questions.
questions in using menti.com. We've had one in already uh, asking what market traction have you had to date? Yes, yeah, so I didn't mention it in the speech, but I've got two co-founders. They're both uh, not here today because they're presently in Nairobi at our pilot facility. Um, and we're actively working with two of Kenya's largest animal feed millers, looking to integrate our, our protein into their, into their formulations. And we also have several letters of intent from waste producers who are looking to um, integrate our hub and spoke uh, waste management solution in directly on their sites. Great stuff, thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, please do get them in on menti.com. Another one in uh, asking, who are your competitors? Yeah, so it's an interesting one. So there are a number of different uh, insect companies in the world, and, and most many countries in Europe have one or two that have, have done reasonably well. Um, but because it's such a large market and so differentiated, there, aren't, there isn't really anyone doing exactly what we're doing. So other companies may focus on things like mealworms or crickets and maybe for human consumption. And many of them to date are focusing on the West where prices are higher and there's you know, lots of supermarkets behind it and, and backing, backing the pricing. Um, our focus, as I mentioned in the pitch, is very much on the Global South where anyone who's really been doing it to date has um, been doing it really through kind of duct tape and sheer will um, at a very kind of small scale, not very consistently, and it's not really meeting the need. So we're really the first um, company to, to bring the technologies, to to the technologies that have been developed in the West and bring them to the global south uh, and offer that kind of hybrid model, which doesn't over-optimize, but allows them to produce uh, at, at a greater scale, more consistently, consistently and with a more consistent quality. Uh, beyond solving the protein crisis, the next question asks, what impact does your solution have on the climate? Yes, yeah, so... Obviously, our key focus is on the, the protein side, but by virtue of us using organic waste, which would otherwise have gone to landfill, and produces a large amount of methane, um, our black soldier fly keep, keeps the CO2 in the system, so it, it doesn't release it, and also when it does eventually get released, it's CO2 rather than methane. We also, by replacing things like soy in particular, which as everyone knows is a really large cause of deforestation, um, we, we you know, avoid that deforestation. And in terms of land use, we're 400 times more efficient in, uh, to produce uh, the same amount of protein than soy farms. Great stuff. Um, a question in asking, what is your revenue model? So there's kind of two streams to it. Um, when we're doing the hub and spoke, it's a bit, it will be, it varies depending on who you're working with. So without going into too much detail, there's various parts of the process of rearing the black soldier fly. As I mentioned, the, the breeding is slightly more difficult and it's very important you get it consistently and do it at quality. So when we're working with the hub and spoke model with our partners, our waste producers, rather than them having to do the whole spectrum of it, we'll sell, sell them the five-day-old larvae um, and then all they need to do is basically pour them into their pre-formulated waste and just leave it there for a couple of weeks with some automation to make, to, to make sure it works okay. But by doing that, we're, we're basically extracting all of the difficult parts and, and, and making it very easy for them to... Um, to manage their waste. So in short, our kind of waste, our revenue sources will be from managing waste, from selling things like five-day-old larvae to the waste producers, and also from eventually selling the actual fully grown larvae to feed millers. It's about $1,000, $1,300 a ton. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, that brings us on to the final pitch in this section. I'd like to welcome uh, Terence from New Oceans, who are reusing recyclable ocean waste flip-flops and turning them into recyclable sandals. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Terence. I'm from the New Oceans team. Our aim is to clean the oceans by reusing ocean waste plastics, um, mainly waste flip-flops and waste sandals, and turning them into new pairs of sandals, um, giving them a new life. So why uh, waste flip-flops? Well, flip-flops are the number one uh, most popular type of footwear in the world, with over a billion pairs produced every year. These are largely unrecyclable, and there's no large-scale commercial process to utilise this source of waste. And moreover, to make things worse, they're often bought and discarded after a short period of use. So a large proportion of beach cleans are actually these waste flip-flops and sandals. We reuse them by turning them into sheets, which are then used to produce our new ocean sandals, which are themselves made from recycled materials and are fully recyclable. 
By using this circular manufacturing process, we aim to break the loop of production and pollution and hopefully do our part in making our oceans a little bit cleaner. So our new ocean sandals, we like to call them NUOs. Um, they use a multi-layer design just to optimize comfort and durability. The multi-colored layer you see in the middle, that's from entirely waste flip-flops and sandals collected from beach cleans. The inside and outsole uses recycled materials to optimize uh, the comfort and durability of the entire product. And the straps are made from ocean recycled polyester, uh, mainly from discarded fishing nets, again, retrieved from the oceans. Our target audience are mainly young professionals from uh, between 25 to 40 years old. Uh, they are mostly environmentally conscious and want to, through their purchasing decisions, be able to make an impact on solving these uh, environmental issues. And through talking to our target audience, uh, through surveys and through interviews, a lot of them have expressed to us that with the current uh, offers there are in sustainable alternatives, that they're either lacking in comfort or durability, a bit bland in design, or they're just simply greenwashing. They only use a very, very small uh, percentage of recycled sustainable materials in their product. At New Oceans, we hope to be able to offer them the full package where we are using fully recycled materials in our product without compromising on the comfort or design. So our team is consisting of six members, all from a variety of different backgrounds, ranging from marketing and branding to scientists to business management. But we all share a passion in that we want to do our little part in helping solve the environmental crises that we all face. Building on our team, we have been lucky enough to form a great board of advisors who have been invaluable in directing our marketing, business strategy, uh, manufacturing process, and they have really helped propel our business forward and help solve a lot of the hurdles. But of course, with any successful business, we can't succeed without the support of our community. So we ask that you join us in our movement. Next year, we'll, in spring next year, we'll be launching our crowdfunding campaign where we'll be launching our first offering of our products. And we ask everyone here tonight who is interested in our business and product or any friends and family who might be interested to just simply go onto our website, sign up to our mailing list and get up our latest updates and keep up to date with our launch. Thank you for listening. Time now for your questions. Please get them in using menti.com. And the first question to kick us off, will you make other products in the future? Yes. So um, our uh, Nuos is just the first uh, pioneer product of our business. We aim to expand into other product ranges, again, utilising the same mindset of using waste materials in a circular manufacturing fashion, um, themselves being fully recyclable. But yes, we will be expanding into other product ranges. This is just our first product question in asking how much waste in kilograms or numbers of flip-flops do you need to make uh, for every pair? Yeah, so obviously this um, differs from pair to pair because obviously there's different sizes and depending on the, um, the density of the flip-flops we collect, but a rough ballpark figure is every pair that we make removes about 600 to 700 grams of uh, plastic waste. Um, please do keep your questions coming in on menti.com. Another one in asks, how do you organise the collection and then processing of the ocean waste before manufacturing? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. We've uh, been lucky enough to set up some partnerships uh, in countries in Thailand and Indonesia who they are currently organising beach cleans already. But as I mentioned before, because flip-flops, they're largely unrecyclable and they're not really an in-demand um, source of waste. So even when these are collected from beach cleans, there's nothing really to do with them. So they quite often end up back in landfills and we were able to get in touch with these uh, clean-up organisations and say, can we take these off your hands? And they're really, they were really um, interested and we formed partnerships and they process and organise um, the collection and cleaning of the waste as well. Good stuff. 
Um, and another question in asks, is can you get the pricing to a point where there's a mainstream, massively adopted product? Yeah, so this is um, one of the big hurdles that we would uh, come across. So right now we have our final product. We're giving, uh, we're going to have our initial launch very soon, uh, early next year, where we'll just be testing and getting feedback on our product. And scalability is going to be the key issue that we have to address here. Right now it is looking like we can get to a point where um, we can keep our profit margins well enough that in mainstream adoption we can we can make this sort of in larger production numbers, but that is um, still in the works. Uh, another question in asks, have you got a system in place for stopping your flip-flops from ending up back in the oceans? Yeah, there's a great question. I didn't actually have time to address this in the pitch. So as I mentioned, our flip-flops themselves are fully recyclable, and it is in our vision that we would offer a recollection scheme as well for our products, where we, if from our worn-out, broken products, um, we expect further down the line, you are able to give them back to us. We are think of several collection processes, um, maybe... Uh, collection bins in um, uh, uh, stores that you can just drop them off and with all your details inside the box that we provide and we'll take them back. We'll be able to recycle them into new pairs of flip-flops and we'll offer you a discount on the next pair that you purchase. So this is our way of preventing our products from then ending back up into the oceans. Brilliant. Um, and I think that brings us to the end of the question. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Well done. Uh, and I just want to say well done to all of the pitches so far. It's not um, easy to get up in front of you and, and share their uh, innovations, but they've done a brilliant job. So thank you very much to you all. Uh, and don't forget, as mentioned throughout uh, this afternoon, please do visit menti.com. Uh, enter the code that you've seen on the screen, 12428767, uh, to score the teams that you have just seen. Uh, and just a reminder, you may need to refresh that page if uh, you're not seeing anything on there new at the moment. Before we kick off with the next lineup of of innovators. Um, really pleased to hand over to our keynote speaker this afternoon, a woman who's worked extensively with uh, large institutions, including the likes of the NHS, to help drive public sector decarbonisation and sustainability. Please join me in welcoming ETL sustainability consultant Hannah Cunningham. Okay, hopefully that doesn't fly off as we go through. Um, so good afternoon, it's great to, to be here and thank you for the invite. Um, I'm Hannah Callingham, I'm a sustainability consultant at ETL. Um, so at ETL we work with a range of public sector organisations advising on decarbonisation and supporting the purchase of net zero technologies. So SMEs make up a whopping 99% of firms in the UK. They're essential to delivering a just and fair distribution um, and transition, sorry, to, to net zero carbon in line with the government's requirements. Um, this is because they generate employment, economic prosperity, innovation and social cohesion, particularly within left behind regions and because combined they contribute a large proportion of the UK's emissions. All SMEs need to meet the legal requirement of net zero carbon by 2050. To do this, they and their investors require better access to uh, legal, financial and business support um, and to be persuaded of the commercial importance of, um, of adapting and the negative consequences of not doing so. So because we work with SMEs who are selling into the public sector, selling their products and services with the NHS, we at ETL know that the SMEs offer um, the means to create innovative solutions to some of their core priorities and challenges and whether that's uh, addressing the backlog to um, changing the way that care is delivered within the community. The NHS staff we work with have an appreciation that each and every way that we do that has to transition through to net zero. So uh, many of you would have been aware that, um, that the NHS has adopted a multi-year plan to become the world's first net zero national health system by 2040 for the emissions that they could directly control and by 2045 for the emissions that they influence. This has driven a huge acceleration in efforts and initiatives being rolled out by NHS trusts. Uh, we've seen it time and time again, startup innovators like yourselves uh, piloting one or two projects with NHS trusts and after a year or two having kind of a, a list as long as your arm of, of projects in the pipeline. 
So similar to private organisations, we are seeing increased competition within the public sector. Um, everyone wants to lead the way and be the best through this diverse sustainability landscape, particularly within the healthcare system. Um, adapting to change and taking the lead is in the DNA of SMEs up and down the country. At ETL, we are also an SME and a social enterprise. We know that we can have a powerful impact on our own operations, our supply chain, and through the work that we provide to our clients. ETL has signed up to WSP's Pledge to Net Zero. As Pledge signatories, we will ensure that ETL achieves a greenhouse gas target in line with 1.5 degrees C. Along this, we have pledged to support smaller signatories to um, report progress and meet the requirements of the pledge. So what's my advice to you and your ventures? Firstly, get a sense of your starting line. Um, when, when thinking about SMEs, they're likely to be ahead of the curve when it comes to sustainability. So, uh, but you will need to measure your, your emissions and your to measure your reduction going forwards. Step two is you need to set out a strategy. What action do you need to take and when? Who in your organisation can get this done? Oops. Next up is governance. How can you help your organisation, everybody, from the board to operations, understand the gap to goal? And how can you highlight the impact of your uh, product or service to your consumer, particularly when considering their own net zero goal? Last but not least, the delivery. Get thinking about the tools, management and resources required to make that transition easier and quicker. So going green can boost your business's bottom line. Research shows that three billion pounds worth of savings can be unlocked by the SME community through simple energy efficiency measures alone. So when it comes to doing business, going low or zero carbon is quickly becoming a requirement rather than a choice. And those ahead of the curve are overwhelmed with opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that brings us round to the second uh, series of pitches now. And uh, please join me in welcoming Rosie Griffiths from Olog uh, to the floor, who, along with her team, is developing clean energy applications, making energy transition and low carbon development decisions quicker and more cost effective. Rosie, over to you. Hi, I'm Rosie. I'm one of the co founders of Olog. Has anyone heard of the word Oluk before? No? Okay. Oluk is a Welsh word for vision or sight. One of the biggest challenges affecting the energy sector at the moment is how do we change from a world that's powered through fossil fuels to a cleaner future that uses renewable energy sources, such as the sun or the sea or the wind. The information and technology to make that change is already available. But... Finding that information can be very difficult. It can be very difficult to understand. And if you ask someone else to help you, that can be very expensive. All that exists to give, make that information easily accessible to everyone. Be that people, energy industry professionals, like say engineers, project developers, investors, or just people from a less technical background perhaps, like local communities, um, local councils, community energy schemes, or just even a single homeowner. So what are we doing exactly to help that? All is making that information easily accessible by building an online platform. Through a series of online web applications and a few simple clicks of the button, the user can quickly calculate and compare all energy transition technologies. And I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, so far to date, we have released our solar photovoltaic application and a hydrogen generation plant application. So using these, we can quickly calculate the potential energy savings, carbon reductions, and actual cost of the project. In September of this year, we launched our product, and to date, we've gained quite a lot of traction. In two years, we believe we will have a fully self-sustaining marketable product. And we fully believe that Oluk can become 
the global trusted choice for easily good quality information and project analysis tools. Thank you. Hey, Tony's going to come and help me. Yeah, okay. He's my co-founder. <laughs> Welcome along. Uh, brilliant stuff. Thank you for kicking off the second round of pitches. Uh, to uh, Over to you now and asking for questions via menti.com. And I'll kick things off with a question we've had in, asking what plans you have for the future development of these tools in 2022. Hey, thank you. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, so currently in the platform, we've got some tools that help people understand some of the kind of, uh, some of, the kind of projects that are very... Um, popular and people talk about this year. So things like hydrogen, um, carbon capture, solar. But as, as we look to next year, um, we'll be looking to, to really concentrate on, on the, those, I think those sources of emissions that dominate where all the CO2 comes from. So things like home heating, uh, things like transportation, um, possibly some agriculture stuff. So that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, <clears throat> And as well, moving away from, from single applications or, or modeling of single projects to uh, being able to join these together. So for example, if you've got intermittent renewables, how do you, how do you mix that with different kinds of storage technologies? Stuff, unless I didn't introduce you, Tony Griffiths from the uh, team with us as well, answering questions that you have. The next one, uh, another one has come in asking, uh, what gave you the idea that this is a problem area? Okay, thank you. Um, so I worked in energy development for a long time. Um, I've been a chemical engineer for over 20 years. And in the process of developing these kind of projects, um, the, the, the problem that comes up again and again is, is how, how can you compare these different kinds of projects really quickly? It's very difficult. So even, even with a background as an engineer or an analyst, having the tools to allow you to screen very quickly is, is quite hard to find. Um, some of them do exist, but they're very, very expensive to use. Um, so that was the problem. It's my own experience, basically. Okay, another question in asking, how do you make money? Do you offer a subscription model for info? Yeah, so a, long, a longer-term revenue, uh, revenue plan is um, membership subscriptions. And what we're looking for is, is to keep the, keep the membership at a price point where it's within, um, within the discretionary spend of, of a manager for example, in an organization. Because um, what, what's, what's available at the moment uh, tends to be very, very expensive, and you have to go through several layers of, of approval to purchase that. So that's longer term, but we consider that we'd probably take uh, another two years to, to develop that critical mass of, of useful content and applications that, that will then uh, mean we'll get that number of subscription. So in the short term, we're looking at paid, um, paid partnerships to help us develop new content uh, with, with industrial or local council or local government customers that helps us de develop applications that they would consider to be useful. Thank you very much, Tony Rosie. Well done. Thank you. Uh, for our next pitch, I'd like to welcome uh, Patrick Jones from uh, Neurosol to the floor. And uh, Neurosol are harnessing the power of microorganisms present in farmers' soil to make farming more sustainable. Over to you. So thank you very much for that, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Patrick Jones. And with me are Helen and Maureen, and we are Neurosol. Now, we all enjoy eating food, but when that food is being produced, it's damaging the environment. And most of that comes down to one chemical element, nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is an essential element. So, no nitrogen, no food. But when farmers are applying that nitrogen onto their fields, most of it is lost into the environment, polluting both air and water. So farmers are presently having to essentially compromise between protecting the environment and generating income. And that's not a great decision to make. And with increasing pressure on all of us to be more sustainable, farmers are now getting desperate. But there is a solution, 
and it's right there under their feet. In the farmer soil, that's where Nurisol will find the very best nitrogen-fixing algae. And we convert that nitrogen-fixing algae into an effective biofertilizer. This is a microorganism that captures uh, nitrogen directly from the at atmosphere and is able to share that with plants. So farmers that use our product, they will see an increased net profit and is also reduced pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Now that's a win-win, which explains why every farmer we've spoken to so far wants to try our product, and there's more than 20 of them. So right now we're asking for half a million pounds to commercialize this business by 2024. So please join us to make this a reality for healthy soils, more food, and a greener planet. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick. And please do uh, get your questions in on menti.com. And to kick things off, a question asking uh, about your relationship with farmers. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, of course. Farmers are very important for us and also very important right now in the development phase. And we're very fortunate to have connected very well with uh, an agronomist at Abel & Cole, who is uh, a leading supplier of organic food in the UK. And together with them, we've already selected farmers that we are going to work with. We're going to do field trials. That's the next thing that's going to happen. Fantastic. OK. Uh, we have a question in asking about the specifics of your technology to create the biofertilizer. Yes, so these are naturally existing microorganisms. Uh, when we produce them, we capture not only nitrogen, but also carbon from the atmosphere. So they come loaded with carbon and nitrogen, but also other nutrients such as phosphorus and sulfur, etc. But when we apply this, uh, when the farmers apply this product in the soil, it continues to fix nitrogen and carbon inside the soil. And that's what makes it an effective fertilizer. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Uh, have you seen a percentage increase in yield after using your product? Well, indeed. So the trials that we've carried out so far has essentially compared uh, the existing fertilizer or um, that are available on the market for both the organic and the conventional uh, fields. For example, when in some cases we see like-to-like uh, -like comparison relative to chemical fertilizers, but in some particular cases with some crops like, uh, like uh, leafy greens, we actually see that it's more efficient than the chemical fertilizer. Now, we're still in the development of this product, and these are, we're going to be able to answer these questions exactly once we've done that, yes. Good stuff. Uh, another question in asks, what does your product look like? How is it applied? That's a great question. In fact, is if you come to our table, we will show you what it looks like. We have a sample there, so you can have a look at it. Uh, so the, the overall, one of the important aspects when it comes to working with farmers is to be able to um, provide a product that's easy for them to use. So we don't want them to have to do any major changes, and that's very important for the adoption of the technology. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, and another question in asks, can you tell us about the rest of your team? Yes. So it's myself. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, Imperial College London. And we also have Marine Valton, who's the co-founder. Uh, unfortunately, she's not able to make it today. Uh, she did a PhD in my group. And we also have Helen, uh, who's with us somewhere here. And she's our first hire, the, the uh, R&D lead. Yes. So thank yeah. you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and of, of course, just a reminder, as mentioned there, that if you have any specific questions that you'd like to put to the team, uh, you can ask them directly after the chat uh, networking session uh, from about half past four onwards, and they'll have tables with signs so you can see everyone and ask them directly. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Gilbert Lennox King to the floor from Construction Carbon leading uh, the next pitch. Uh, Construction Carbon founded by property professionals frustrated with the complexity of a route to net zero uh, development. Gilbert, over to you.
When it comes to the decarbonisation of construction, the building industry is still laying the foundations and we, we need your help to speed this up. 11% of global emissions come from construction. 11%. And yet, the vast majority of developers, we estimate, based on, based on our analysis, about 98% of developers are not factoring this into their procurement decisions currently. This is largely because they don't have an accessible means to calculate the carbon emissions associated with their project, reduce at the point of design, and then offset those emissions. Without this process, it will be impossible to achieve net zero. Furthermore, for a typical building, up to half of the carbon emitted in the entire building life cycle is emitted before people move in. To address this, Construction Carbon has developed software to easily estimate the carbon impact of a construction project, to find assessors that can conduct assessments to a standardised approach in line with leading national and international standards, provide options to reduce the carbon intensity of that build, credibly offset using international standards for offsetting, and then importantly, have a forum for publicising the results. Demand for the software service is universal. Developers need a level playing field. Consumers need to know that what they're buying is net zero. Financiers, like HSBC, need a tool to make sure that what they're financing is doing no harm. And local governments need a mechanism to enforce carbon reductions. Construction carbon are an award-winning, revenue-generating startup. In the last six months, we have delivered 13 projects, ranging from small London office fit-outs of 3,000 square feet, to Amazon's new 200 million euro Italian distribution centre. We've been, uh, we have SEIS and EIS advance assurance, and along with the greenhouse, we've also been accepted onto the Asta Foundation Accelerator, and the Slaughter in May Accelerator. We've received interest uh, globally in, in what we're doing from Canada, Europe, Asia, and Australia and New Zealand. Within the next three years, construction carbon will be the industry standard globally. Within the next 24 months, we are looking to raise two million pounds in order to build out our software platform so that it's accessible to anyone doing a construction project, to launch our carbon accredited professional training program in association with leading industry bodies, and to significantly increase our team in terms of research and development, sales and product. Will you join us in our mission to make net zero construction accessible to anyone doing a construction project? Time for questions, and please do get them in using menti.com. And we'll just kick things off with a uh, first question asking how you're different to bring the meat. Yes, um, so Priam and Leah, Priam and Lead, uh, are fantastic because obviously they drew a spotlight onto the sustainability of buildings. Um, but really with Priam and Lead, first and foremost, they're accessible only to the developers and people undertaking construction who have very deep pockets and both financial and administrative capacity to undertake that process. And also, they look at things very much from a consideration perspective rather than an action perspective. 
um, what we are creating is something that is accessible to anyone uh, from someone undertaking a small domestic uh, extension up to those people such as the NHS who are undertaking very significant development projects. Stuff. A question comes in asking how do you incorporate the needs of various uh, parties in the construction chain from developers, designers, contractors, etc.? Um, so the... I can answer that if you like. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's, I mean, it's, it, it, the, the question is um, every construction project has a number of different uh, elements that need to fall into place, um, primarily scope three emissions. Um, and if you think about a construction project, how it's actually delivered, it's primarily coordination of many different parties in the construction chain. So architects, designers, developers, contractors, yes, that is construction. Um, having a standardized method of calculating the embodied emissions associated with that project needs to happen. It, it, in some elements, some developers are doing this, um, but what they are doing currently is marking their own homework and pr producing their own results. And that, that won't um, continue into, into the future. Uh, another question in asking how you plan to scale what sounds like quite a hands-on offering. Uh, yes, well, I mean, that, that's really part of the problem um, currently um, is that it's a very clunky procedure. Um, our software platform ultimately will enable anyone to uh, initially undertake a, a, a sort of pretty high level assessment to get a very clear idea of what their carbon hotspots are in construction. But thereafter, it's a case of pulling together the different moving parts. Um, the, uh, the issue at the moment is the number of people who can actually undertake the assessments themselves. We're working with Briam and lead APs, um, people who undertake life cycle carbon assessments already as part of that process. Um, but we are also working with um, uh, industry bodies, we're in conversation with the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, we have pulled together a team of the leading industry experts, certainly nationally and perhaps internationally, to create a qualified carbon assessor programme. And we're also working alongside um, uh, bodies like Elmhurst Energy, who have 7,500 energy assessors, who are there very keen to push towards becoming um, uh, carbon assessors as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, which brings us to our uh, final picture for this session. David Wharton, founder and CEO of Filia. Over to you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. So, question to you first. Now, what do you think a blackout blinds are? Now, these are blackout blinds. What do they do? They cool homes during the summer months and warm uh, houses during the winter months. And I can't stress this enough. There are near enough every home and, and many offices where it's warm. So in the UK, this might be strange to you because obviously it's not warm, um, but I can't stress these enough. And these are some I like, took while I was in Spain this summer. Feely is a revolutionary product that brings any window building solar power, uh, meaning every window can embrace the limitless power of the sun. And for the first time, any flat can now directly generate their own solar power. So, more and more people are living in cities. The numbers speak for themselves. So with Philia, if you own or rent property, it reduces your energy bills. Now with record energy prices, it's Philia is the right business at the right time. If you're a developer, it makes your properties more attractive. Why? It brings your, your potential clients cheaper energy bills, and to your investors, it brings um, it, to your investors it helps bring their ESG targets. And if you're a property developer, it will feel it will help you attain your ever increasing ESG targets. So the solar sector is massive growth. You can the number speaks for itself. And post COVID, we're seeing huge. In, Incentives. So, for example, in Spain, and I stress this is a small ex example, 6.8 billion euros has been committed to the installation of solar panels for residential properties. Now, with over 66% of people living in flats in Spain, Filia wants to take a big chunk of that pie. And with Filia board members, we have direct access to the most highest levels of the Spanish government. Um, and, you know, Filia 
it's the global expansion and we want to be in all markets. So for example, in China, 880 million people live in cities. So the potential is just massive. So some information about Philia. So it's EU patent pending and my patent attorney is in, is in the building. We got really good positive feedback from the EU patent office. And soon after that feedback, we submitted the PCT. The global HQ will be in the Basque country in Spain. And Philia has raised over 1.2 million euros in private funding from investors from the UK, Mexico, and Spain. So, with Philia, any window can now become a solar panel. The possibilities are endless. Happy to take your questions. Uh, right, time for uh, your questions. Please, uh, as a reminder, do get them in via menti.com. If you go online now and refresh the page, uh, you should be able to put your question in there. And, and starting off, David, with a question uh, about the efficacy of the solar panels in your uh, blinds compared to more standard panels. The efficiency. Yeah, so it's a, so it's a next generation of solar panels. It's more like a film, um, and it's around 16% efficiency. Uh, the main solar ingredient is this new wonder material called perovskites. And the trend for perovskite is the efficiency is going to increase, but at the moment it's 16%. But the key thing with this new solar te technology is cost. I cannot describe how cheap it is to make. So from a square meter of solar film, it would probably retail at around $30 per square meter. So much cheaper than silicon. Great stuff. Um, and while we wait for... Uh questions, one that's just come in, asking uh, how do they work in practice? Do you need a generator? Do you need batteries at home? Uh, and what are the challenges of, uh, for example, them getting hot whilst they're being used at the house? Yeah, so, um, so with this new solar film, it's pen uh, temperature independent, so if it's hot, it doesn't decrease the efficiency, unlike traditional silicon panels. And how blackout blinds are, all the modern ones now have electric motors, so with the solar panels, it's just an additional bit of wiring that would feed into a battery system or into the grid. It depends on you know, the location of where the house is and what, what the regulations are. But in the future, you know, Germany, just with a new coalition, they've said every industrial roof um, has to have solar panels. And I soon expect you know, regulations will come in. There. There'll have to be a smart system in there, every house with a small battery pack. So it will feed the house and, uh, or, or office block uh, directly and self-consumption. Um, you know, if you think of the south of Spain, millions upon millions of second homes, and they'll probably use two weeks of the year, Philia will be there just to generate and sustain that uh, home for when people are not there. Stuff. Another question in asking, uh, what will be your go-to market strategy to achieve scale? So uh, for scale, um, there's a various business models. So... One, we're, we're setting up a sister company where we're actually going to make the actual solar panels ourselves called Everin. Um, from a scale, from a Philia perspective, quite a lot of uh, the blackout blinds are already incorporated into uh, the prefabricated windows. So we'll be doing a licensing deal. Then you think of all the existing uh, blackout blinds globally. Uh, we'll be just selling the, the relevant parts and the solar panels themselves. So actually... Philia won't be making many blackout blinds. We'll be selling either the licensing IP or um, providing the parts. So it's, um, the scale is quite extensive. And that, I think that shows with the investment within, you know, we open up funding round to, um, to a few firms and uh, family and friends. And, you know, as of yesterday, sorry, it's 1.5 million euros. So, and we got that within the space of two weeks. So, you know. Uh, I can't stress enough, blackout blinds are every window, well, not every window, but near enough every window in uh, countries where it's hot. So when I you know, spoke to Naveed and Richard for the first time about blackout blinds, they were like, what are you on about? I have no idea. Uh, but just think about when you're going abroad again, you'll, you'll notice them, them everywhere. Thank you very Thank much. Uh, thank you so much to, uh, to David and all of our brilliant second round of pitches. We are now into the third and final round of pitches. Thank you so much to you all and to our uh, pitches so far. Brilliant startups and four more still to come. 
Now to introduce this session, please welcome one of the pioneers of technology-focused climate change innovation in the UK, the Director of Innovation at the Grantham Institute and our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Templer. Well, I, I hope you'll indulge me. I think I've got five minutes. And the indulgence I want is to just tell you a little bit about the history of, of where we are now and how that came to be. Um, and it isn't, you are indulging me. It's, it's, it's me telling you about the things that have gone on basically over the last 11 years. So um, in 2010, a group of us that was actually centered around Imperial College and um, ETH Zurich founded a thing called the Climate Kick. It still exists. Um, it's a big European project. It's a, it's a partnership between industry and academia with the, with, the, with the intent to do something about climate change through innovation. Um, and I'm very proud to have, to have been one of the people who, who wrote the original grant um, that, that brought the thing to life. But I'm most proud about the, the way in which that program, um, that project, um, founded an accelerator, an accelerator that, that spanned, at its, at its height, spanned Europe. And, of course, I'm most proud about the bit that we had in London at Imperial College. Um, the first group of, of startups that we had um, started with us at the end of 2011. Now, we started in 2010, and we spent the first one and a half years arguing about contracts. Hey-ho. Um, yeah, that'll be familiar to some of the startups, arguing about contracts. Um, once we got that sorted out, we were able to start, and we, 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 we brought in our first group of, of, of startups, um, very much like the group that we brought in at the beginning of this year. It was all done very rapidly because we needed to get on and uh, contracts had been late and all the rest of it. Um, but in fact, from that group, that very first group, the one of those startups, uh, a startup called Naked Energy, um, has really sort of grown incredibly over the last couple of, of, of years. And um, they, they just, you know, for me, the exciting thing was they said, oh yeah, and by the way, um, the British Library has, has bought an order from us to put our solar photovoltaic system on the roof of the British Library. And um, I, when I wrote the original grant, and I, wrote, I had to write down an estimate of what, what these startups would do and how much money they would raise, uh, I, I laughed at myself. I thought, ha, yeah, right. That's, that sounds realistic, Richard. Well, you know, you bullshit in every grant application you ever write, right? Um, and the thing is, we've actually uh, done far, far more than I thought we would do. So the thing that historically now from those first um, graduates from the program in 2012 that's happened is those, those startups have raised, we believe, over half a billion dollars. Um, and even when I say that, I kind of go, that's, you know, that's, is that real? And that's just London. That's just the imperial branch of this. And they've just been amazing. And, you know, numbers are great, right? And, you know, two-thirds of our startups that come in go on to become functioning company, raise all that money, create employment, and do stuff about climate change. And this generation is showing no difference in behavior. Um, we, we've not graduated them yet, and they're already, they've already raised actually more than two million, because one of them just told me about some extra money that they've raised. So it's all happening still, and it still looks like um, you know, this is a burgeoning field, and we've got great founders making, making change happen. And I'd just like to finish maybe by, you know, apart from the fact of telling you about my both delight and my shock, at looking at the numbers and, and, and just the feeling of, uh, yeah, pride in, in, in them, not in me, pride in, in what they've achieved, is the stories uh, of, these, of these companies. 
So I've told you a little bit about Naked Energy, but another one was, was Grop Farms, um, which uh, a student from Imperial who was doing a master's with us founded. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, it now is a company that does controlled uh, environment agriculture. And Kate was, I, I took her on because I thought she was gonna make a fantastic leader and I was wrong. I didn't believe in her business model and I was right, but she recovered from all of that and she's now building a farm uh, on many tens of millions of pounds of investment in Wales. And all of that dream that she came to us with um, and all of her fight to make it happen is a story that's told multiple times over um, and yeah, I'm getting goosebumps saying it because I, it, I still find it amazing. And I'm looking at Beverly Gower Jones because I know that she does this as well, feels it is amazing. Um, and for those of you who are about to stand up and give your talks, and those of you who have already given your talks, you're part of this story and you will make a difference. Just keep on keeping on, make it happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. Right, that brings us on to uh, the final round of pitches. And I'd like to start by inviting Harry Grocott from Tree Economy to the floor, who are developing technology to improve carbon removal calculations in trees and forests. Harry, over to you. How many marbles are in this jar? We don't know. We could take a best estimate, though. If we knew the height of the jar and we knew how wide it was, we could figure out how many marbles could fit within that. And if we then had a table of jars, well, we could multiply by the number of jars, and then we'd figure out how many marbles are across all of them. But what if we didn't know the size of the jar, nor how many marbles are there? Well, this is pretty much exactly how the voluntary carbon market works. Trees, forests, nature-based solutions touted as the best solution in the short and medium term to combat climate change and support the transition to a net zero carbon economy. But the fact of the matter is, we simply do not know how to quantify carbon in standing trees and forests. We don't know how many marbles are in the jar. And this is a big, big problem. Tree economy is fixing this by using remote sensing technology and improving the way that we account for carbon at the project level. 21% of the world's largest companies have now set net zero targets. That's $14 trillion of sales between them. And every single one of those companies will have to buy carbon offsets in some form. It's the net in net zero. The transactions for these, uh, or the, the number of these transactions is expected to grow by 50 times over the next eight years alone. The majority of these will have to come from nature-based sources because it's the only technology that's commercially viable today. But if this market is to scale, to meet this massive increase in demand, two things will have to happen. Number one, buyers will have to be confident in what they're buying. And number two, somebody is going to have to invest into these projects to get them developed. Neither of these things are going to happen if we can't bring in sophisticated investors and risk capital because we don't have very basic project level data. Tree Economy is fixing this by using very high resolution remote sensing data from satellite and drones. We then use machine learning technology and other software systems to count every single tree, track every single ton of CO2 within the forest site to the extent that we can actually track each ton of CO2 back to the exact tree or trees that they come from. To put this another way, oil and gas companies know how much oil and gas they have within a well and they know exactly how much oil and gas they remove. Tree economy is working in the opposite direction. We suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And now with Sherwood, our platform, we have the tools to become as sophisticated and data rich as they are. This puts us in a position whereby we can massively scale the number of projects that we can do. And this is exactly what we intend to do. We currently have 40 projects in our pipeline representing 6.2 megatons of CO2 removal potential. The first three of these are currently under development and are being planted as we speak. We've now closed our first sale, 
which is significantly above the market rate, supporting our hypothesis that companies will, buy, will pay more for trusted, highly quantified carbon offsets. And we now plan to scale by partnering with investors in nature to create more projects, and most excitingly for me, to use our technology to create new sources of supply, coming from things like rewilding and alley cropping. These are project types that are too complex for the current market uh, and methodology framework, but our technology is strong enough to enable and bring them to life. We're now raising our first funding round, looking to raise 850,000 pounds, with which we intend to complete the build out of our Sherwood platform, like I've just been showing you, to lock in our commercial pipeline and further extend our technical remote sensing capabilities. We're asking for your help through funding and partnerships to ensure that the carbon market does not fail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Harry. Right, time for questions. And to kick things off before your questions feed through on menti.com, uh, we've had a question in asking about the differences between tree economy and your competitors in carbon offsetting. Sure. Um, so really, the main focus for us against other sort of tech-enabled companies that are now coming out is our focus on, on very high-resolution bottom-up analysis. So we're not trying to figure out, you know, are there trees or are there not trees? We're not looking at sort of avoided deforestation projects. We're trying to figure out exactly within a, a forested area how much carbon is in there. And that's a very different approach. Uh, and there's, there's very few other companies at the moment that are, that are looking at doing this. And even then, we're not looking to just be a, a passive sort of standoff um, tech provider. We're looking to be very active. So like I was saying with these new project types, bringing these new sources to market so we can, one, suck more CO2 out, and two, provide finance to these, these really high-impact projects. Fantastic stuff. Please do uh, get your questions in on menti.com. Uh, one question in from an audience member asks uh, about your revenue model. What is it? Sure. Good question. Um, so basically, we're, we're set up to sell carbon offset credits. So we're creating these projects. Uh, we partner with, with landowners. We, we bring these projects to life. Um, or or we're, we're potentially now looking at also partnering with uh, investors in nature to, to create these projects. Um, and then we're basically taking these, these carbon offsets that stem from the project to market and selling them. So we work on a, a revenue share model. We take about 30% from, from projects and, and carbon sales. So it's a, it's a brokerage. Fantastic. Uh, question asked at COP26, we saw the first moves to protect these forests through international treaties. What impact uh, will this have on the carbon offset market? I think, I think that was a question for Article 6 at, at COP, which I don't think they fully answered. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, look, we, there's, there's no point in us planting trees in our, our projects. First projects will be in Scotland. There's no point in us planting them if, if these are being chopped down elsewhere. So um, we completely support um, this, this move to, to uh, prevent deforestation. I think it has happened once or twice before with these um, sort of uh, forward-leaning sort of policy announcements. Um, really, we're looking at carbon removal, not avoided emissions. So we're starting to see the market for this really split in two. So um, I think it's a, quite what the impact will be on that avoided emissions carbon offset type uh, will be seen, to be honest. I don't think we really know the answer to that. Um, but our focus as a business is really on that removal portion, not so much on, on the avoided emissions part. So I think we're, we're slightly insulated from that. Okay. Another question asks about the advantages of, of starting in the UK and what those advantages are, uh, and also about your plans to expand geographically. Sure. So the, the UK is a really good starting point for us. Um, yes, we're a small island nation, so we're quite a small land area, uh, but only about 13% of the land is, is uh, covered in forest, so there's a, there's a large way to go. Um, there's a very strong policy incentive as well. So the Committee on Climate Change has a target for 30,000 hectares of trees or of, of new trees to be created or, or planted every year. We're only about 14,000 hectares in of that on an annual basis. So we're, we're not even half the way. So we have a really strong sort of directive. This is what we have to hit. So we're, we're working within that framework. Um, and there's a, a domestic standard as well, uh, which helps us and, and means we can move a little bit faster. Um, in terms of expanding internationally, we're, we're currently speaking to a, a private bank in, in Germany to look at a project there and also one in, in Canada as well. Uh, and we have a really exciting project in Ecuador uh, we're scoping out as well. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, that brings us to our next picture, Angus Rowley from Algreen. Algreen is producing the first algal biogradable and environmentally sustainable labels to replace plastic tags and stickers. Angus, over to you. Physical labels are everywhere. 
they're on our food, they're on our clothes, and they're on any of the packages that we get delivered. In the UK, plastic packaging contributes to 70% of our annual plastic waste. That's 70% of our 2.3 million tonnes of annual plastic waste. And over half of this, which could be recycled, will end up in landfill or be destroyed. And that doesn't even account for all of the labels plastering this packaging, which are actually even more carbon intensive to produce. These labels are estimated to contribute to 3.5% of the emissions of this plastic packaging. And while that might seem like a small number, this actually equates to 62,000 flights between London and New York every year from the UK alone. That's 62,000 long haul flights. Now, obviously, biopackaging has already been developed, but very little attention has been paid to the labels covering this packaging, which are deceptively hard to recycle. That's because biopackaging is a single layer of one material, whereas labels are made up of multiple layers of many different materials, and that includes inks and adhesives as well. That is why, at Algreen, we have developed the first fully biodegradable label made from, Algreen, made from algae. Sorry. And that means that every single layer is 100% biodegradable. We chose algae as our raw material due to the additional environmental benefits that it brings. It acts as a carbon sink, it doesn't compete with arable land, and it can also be grown in brackish water that would have no other uses. Probably the most innovative aspect of our label is the biodegradable adhesive. And it's probably the most important aspect to breaking the recycle barrier. And we actually think this adhesive could have a number of other applications in different industries as well. There are two types of labels. There's the stretch label, which has a net worth of $15.5 billion and a self-adhesive label with a worth of $59 billion. And the good news is that we've already developed both of these labels at a lab scale, and we're currently working with a partner in, in, in industry to test out these labels on current manufacturing equipment. But we now need half a million pounds to achieve seamless industry integration and to help us obtain intellectual property protection and industry certificates over the next 18 months. <coughs> Join us in making every label a biodegradable label. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Angus. Uh, time for your questions now, and please do uh, get them in. Welcome uh, via menti.com. And kicking off with uh, a question about the other products that can be made uh, from your innovation. Tell us more. Oh, uh, we develop a adhesive formula because everywhere need a glue. So we currently accept the label. We also have chipboard. We also have like fashion accessories. So all of them we have a prototype. Uh, in the counter, and we can display it later. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, a question has come in from uh, audience members asking, what do you need to do to scale up your label production? Uh, yeah, currently the label is like in a pallet scale, like we make it in a lab. But if we want to go to the industry, uh, like we need to use the current label production machine to do the production. I, I think it's not feasible, like we make new label and ask the whole industry to change a new machine. So we want to try like uh, which machine, for example, which printing technology is the most uh, cost saving one and which technology should achieve a kind of win-win uh, uh, procedure. Stuff. Uh, another question asks about the types of algae that you're using. Uh, we can say it's a seaweed, yeah, so it's kind of difficult to ask to release all the formula. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, any other questions in? Uh, let's see. Yes, how do, you, uh, how do your CO2 emissions compare to recyclable plastic? Um, I think it's a kind of different category because like uh, usually because our material is fully bio-based and after decomposition, the material will become like uh, biogas. But uh, in terms, so the chemical structure is kind of different from plastics. So what we can say is like our material, we can achieve 70% carbon reduction compared to plastics. <laughs> Uh, another question asks about the compatibility. Uh, how compatible is the new glue with the existing uh, recycling infrastructure? Uh, yeah, like um, currently our glues 
uh, it has a chemistry name called polyurethane. So currently, the most carbon-saving polyurethane it can achieve like 30% carbon reduction because the the R&D procedure is still like kind of old. So there are still like some kind of petrol ingredient inside. But thanks to our technology, we use seaweed. So the whole material, the whole component of our glue is from um, renewable resources like uh, uh, like seaweed. So it's, uh, I think it's like, it's completely from the different one and we are able to achieve 100% composite, uh, compositable at the industry composition facility. Brilliant stuff, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, I'd like to invite Ivor Tucker from Hope's Sustainability to uh, take to the floor. Uh, Hope's delivers an ambitious climate action education program to create climate aware young children. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. School children are your future stakeholders, your talent pool, your potential shareholders, your customers, and the community in which you operate. They're all intensely aware and concerned about issues around climate action, around um, survival of the planet, biodiversity, etc. The problem is that, that sustainability and climate action are not currently part of the national curriculum, although the Department for Education has taken a giant leap forward in announcing that there will be an a climate sustainability um, curriculum introduced from 2023 onwards. The problem is at the moment, Teachers have very few, if any, resources to answer the pressing questions that the school pupils ask them every day of the week. It's also very clear that virtually every large company has adopted significant climate and decarbonisation strategies in their operations and are investing enormous amounts of money in starting to implement those commitments and obviously we're also having to report those commitments on an annual basis now as part of the new announcement by the Chancellor that um, they will have to report on carbon targets alongside their financial re results. The problem is that the general public haven't got a clue about what those targets are and what is involved in them. The, most companies will publish a sustainability report on their website, but the average school child, their parents and the general public don't go and read those reports. So they have very little understanding about the issues and tend to have very superficial views about what action is being taken by the corporate world in terms of addressing these pressing issues. What is amazing, though, is that most companies have devoted very little um, resource or investment to communicate about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they plan to achieve their targets, and allow for an interactive discussion with the communities about what they're doing. So this is where Hope Sustainability comes in. We're a social enterprise, so we're a not-for-profit company the only one in this cohort. Um, but what we're looking to do is provide corporates or investors, if you have portfolio companies, or anybody that is doing interesting stuff around sustainability, we're providing a unique opportunity to connect with, with schools and integrate the activities that you're doing with elements of the national curriculum, so that when pupils learn about a theory, for example, how electricity works, there will be resources available to understand about the renewable transition about solar panels, how solar panels actually are manufactured and, and how energy is generated within that panel. And the same applies in virtually every area of science, geography, D&T. The, the entirety of the curriculum has elements of sustainability. And the idea basically is to embed sustainability as part of the national curriculum right through from year three, around about seven, eight-year-old kids, every year till they leave school, with the intention that by the time they leave school, they're environmentally aware young adults who understand the complexities of the science behind climate change, what are the challenges, the obstacles, and the opportunities, and the fact that it has to be a transition over many years. You can't just wave a magic wand and suddenly everything's wonderful tomorrow. What we're looking for are to develop long-term partnerships with companies that are genuinely committed to the implementation of their sustainability um, targets, and to build learning resources that will integrate over this 10-year journey with the education process. The outcome for corporates, for investors, for academia, um, for local councils, all of whom have got um, significant investments in climate action activities, will be long, building long-term relationships with pupils 
and taking the time to explain the issues, the complexities, so that you get away from these superficial perceptions and get deeply into understanding about these issues and, and letting kids develop their learning over many years the same way they would learn maths or English. Lessons are not done in three weeks in a given year. They're done over many, many years. This will allow people to present themselves as potentially interesting companies to work for, who, companies who have a purpose and believe in what they're doing, um, potentially as, as the, develop relationships with potential customers and generally the community. Uh, you've heard some fantastic pitches today from all these um, companies and the greenhouse is only one accelerator of many, many organizations that are developing clean tech and, and interesting new green technologies. But kids need to understand that these are the opportunities available to them. So what we're looking for is, we, the other thing about these companies is that they don't have the time or the resources or the finances to create the learning resources and get them into schools. So what we're looking for is support from you, potential investors, venture capitalists, um, or corporates, to help fund the cost of developing the learning resources so that we can present these companies to school kids, um, get them excited, and potentially they can understand that they could be the entrepreneurs of tomorrow who will solve the next level of climate issues and green issues. So please come and talk to us about how we can work with you to develop a pilot project if you're a corporate, or how you can help fund the development of learning resources if you're an investor or just a supporter who believes that kids need to understand the, the core deep issues around climate so they can make positive contributions when they leave school. Thank you very much. very much indeed, Ira, and uh, well done, very much. Um, please you. do uh, get your questions in now, and kicking off uh, with one, uh, I wonder your thoughts, Ira, on, on uh, how corporate commitments to uh, on climate change uh, link to the national curriculum. Okay, so basically companies are doing amazing things, and they're making major commitments, but people just don't know who they are, and unless the, the students are actively involved or engaged in or interested in business, they don't know anything about it. I, had a, a focus group that we did recently with some recent graduates who are all intelligent young adults really committed to climate change. And I asked them about Unilever, a um, company that's probably got one of the most, most high-level sustainability commitments in, in the world. And the first response was, who's Unilever? Um, and the reason, they, they all know about haagen ice cream or Dove, Pro, uh, Dove soap, but they didn't know who the company is that stands behind those. And they certainly had no idea about what Unilever is doing in terms of its a sustainability relating to R&D, to strategy, to uh, logistics, to supply chain. So it's really important that kids get to understand these issues. And a climate curriculum that the government is introducing, the danger is that it'll just be about the theories of climate change. But that actually isn't any good unless the kids understand how those theories can be applied or, or are being applied in the real world by the corporate sector. So that's really what we're looking to do is connect with companies who can take the time to explain to kids what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what are the challenges? And get an interactive process so that the kids can actually challenge them and say, why are you not doing it this way instead of that way? And the companies that are genuine about it will take that feedback, hopefully, and, and make their processes better as a result. Thank you. Um, question in asking about how you will scale up. Um, so we're starting off, we're um, working with three types of partners. So one are corporates, one are local councils, and obviously the core is, is around the schools. So we're starting to do some work um, with a Bromley Council in London, who invested in a project that will allow us to start working with a number of their schools in their borough to firstly install energy efficiency projects, uh, sensors in the schools that will help to reduce their energy bills. But on the back of that, the kids will get engaged with, with re research and activities around energy efficiency in the schools. Um, there are over 300 local councils in the UK, so all of them potentially would be able to replicate that sort of process. Um, Every single large corporate that has adopted sustainability um, commitments is a potential partner for us um, in every industry sector, energy obviously being a key one, but it really, every single area, whether it be sustainable finance, um, production methods, manufacturing, um, clean tech, everything is around that process um, that will be involved. So there are vast opportunities and really the only um, limit to our scaling is building up our team and working with corporates. So the, you know, the world's our oyster. Another question asks, are you only open to philanthropic money uh, or can we invest somehow? So as a social enterprise, we can't take equity investment, um, but we're very happy to uh, look at any other forms of investment that might be of interest. Um, so because we're a social enterprise, 
you know, we can't take a situation where people are looking for capital growth. But other than that, we're open, we operate just like any other company. And uh, we're certainly interested in talking to anybody who would like to work with us or support us in some way. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, and that brings us on to our final uh, pitch of the afternoon from Francisco Malaret from Nanomax, who are cleaning up the production of zinc oxide for use in products as, uh, such as sunscreen, tyres and batteries. Over to you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Cosmetics, paint, tyres, ceramics, all these products that we encounter every day and that we need to support our way of life rely on zinc oxide. But let me tell you the dark side in, of this wonderful material. Currently, it is produced through pyrometallurgical processes, which require the, uh, the use of fossil fuels and very uh, high temperatures, above 1,000 Celsius. Actually, these processes, they produce more CO CO2 than the actual material. For every kilogram of zinc oxide that is being produced right now, the equivalent of three kilograms of CO2 go into the atmosphere. This is obviously not sustainable, not in line with the net zero targets by 2050, and solutions are urgently needed. At Nanomox, we want to change this. We want to reinvent the way inorganic materials are made. And for that, we have developed a patent pending process to transform metals, either pure or waste, into advanced inorganic materials. To do this, we have developed green catalytic solvents that do not evaporate, they can be easily recycled, and they allow us to run uh, our reactions at very low temperatures compared to traditional methods. So we can save 97% of the energy. Moreover, we can control the particle morphology so that we can optimize the material for the different applications. So in summary, our value proposition for our clients are materials optimized for their applications, supplied at a very low cost, and with a very low carbon footprint. Now, the zinc oxide market, it is very large. It was valued at 4 billion pounds in 2019 and growing. Our beachhead market is zinc oxide as a UV blocker for sunscreen manufacturing. Uh, this market was valued at 215 million pounds in 2019 and growing very fast, mainly driven by legislation that is being enforced in places like the United States, Hawaii, to ban chem uh, toxic chemical-based UV blockers that actually now dominate about 95% of the market. So within this space, we're already working with several uh, cosmetic uh, companies, including big corporates such as uh, L'Oreal. We're also exploring other applications, zinc oxide for tire manufacturing, and uh, emerging battery technologies using zinc oxide as electroactive uh, material. Uh, we have a very ambitious agenda uh, to bring these materials to market, so next year, uh, we were awarded an um, Innovate UK grant to transform metallic waste from the steel industry into uh, advanced zinc oxide. We're working closely with our partners Ever Resource and Phoenix Battery Recycling to recover zinc from spent alkaline batteries. We have secured an amazing partnership with the Material Processing Institute to scale up our process. So we're going to reach 100 kilograms production next year. And finally, we're going to provide samples to early adopters so that they can validate that our materials are performing better than uh, the zinc oxide that is currently available in the market. Um, for this, we're seeking to raise 500,000 pounds by the end of the first quarter of next year. And I would like to point out that Nanomox is uh, SCIS, EIS eligible. Uh, so who will join us in our mission to decarbonize the production of zinc oxide and other inorganic materials? Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, time now for some questions. Please do get them in on menti.com. And kicking off uh, with a question uh, about the plans you have, if any, to uh, make other materials uh, beyond zinc oxide. Yeah, sure. So um, we have developed a platen, uh, platform technology that can produce several materials. So, so far, we have made other zinc-based uh, products, such as zinc hydroxide, and actually some novel materials. So the opportunities are, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. We have also um, uh, processed other material, other metals, such as iron, titanium, uh, copper. So, yes, a lot of opportunities. And... Uh, moreover, 
We are producing hydrogen as a byproduct. Uh, we're also thinking about ways to recover it and commercialize it. I will be demonstrating our process in our table, so yeah, come and see the hydrogen. <laughs> Uh, any questions in? Uh, yes, let's start with uh, one that's come in asking about the challenges in scaling up production. What will they be? Yeah, so the technology has been uh, validated at lab scale, and uh, next year we will be scaling up. Um, this has become now an engineering problem, so I would say we have the challenges of scaling up any, any technology. So we have a plan. We will be working with the Material Processing Institute next year, who will provide uh, support and the facilities to do these uh, trials prior to the commercial plants. Great stuff. Um, another question in asking about, let's see, uh, how do you deliver products to the market currently? So right now we're producing the products uh, at lab scale. Um, yes in our facilities at Imperial College, London. And the plan is uh, next year, to, when we scale up the process, to provide larger quantities to potential customers and early adopters. Great stuff. Uh, a question in asks, can this be an ingredient in green sunscreen? Yeah, so um, currently there are two types of sunscreens, uh, the chemical-based and the mineral ones. So the FDA in the United States um, have raised a red flag on all the chemical-based UV blockers because they are toxic not only for humans but also for the environment. And now only the mineral ones, which are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, are considered safe. So um, currently uh, the market is dominated by the chemical-based UV blockers. So there is, there is an amazing opportunity for the mineral-based sunscreen. So that's why we have chosen that particular application of, as our first uh, offering. Stuff. Uh, another question in asks, does your process only work with recycled metals uh, or have you developed a method to process zinc ones and how does this compare in terms of scale? So our process can uh, use either pure metals or recycled metals, waste. So um, in order to, to make, uh, to improve the, prof the profitability and environmental credentials, it will be ideal to deal with uh, metallic waste stream, streams. Uh, current processes, they cannot do this very efficiently, so they require very high temperatures to melt the, the metallic materials, and this is not really in, on, in line with the net uh, zero targets by 2015. Thank you very much indeed. Thank well you. Done. Uh, that brings us to a close pitching-wise this afternoon. Well done to all the startups who've pitched so far this afternoon. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already, please head to menti.com. Uh, enter the code you can see on screen. Just a reminder, that is 12428767. Uh, and you can score the teams that you've just seen there. You have uh, a few minutes to do that before we uh, add up, calculate all the scores. So please get that done as soon as possible. Uh, there were two teams uh, who weren't able to be here today. Today, two of the startups unable to make it. And uh, for more on, on those two teams, a brief summary now with Naveed Chowdhury. Naveed, over to you. Thank you, Ray. Um, so hopefully you got the, the voting code. Um, if not, maybe you could just click, click back to it for a second. Um, that is the, the last voting we'll have for the day. Um, so I'll just, I'll just leave it up there for, for a couple of seconds. And um, yeah, we'll just move on to talk about um, Carbon Infinity. So yeah, the eagle eye amongst you will have noticed that obviously we said there'll be 14, 15 teams here, uh, and only 12 were able to make it as a late case of illness, and also the, the change in COVID rules um, meant one of the teams couldn't make it back and get a negative test in time. So um, we're absolutely equally as proud of these teams as we are of the of the others. So Carbon Infinity is the first one that we will we will discuss very briefly. Um, I'm not going to attempt to do justice to the, to the amazing work that they're doing, but um, they joined us in January as well, and we were actually delighted when their application came through because um, there's obviously a huge amount of interest and focus at the moment on direct air capture, carbon removal technologies, and we hadn't seen many that were being developed from the UK itself. So they are one of a, a small handful of um, UK-grown companies that are working in that space, 
And a very interesting angle there is that David uh, Izakovitz, the, the founder, he is a serial entrepreneur. He's built a business before, which he has exited and decided to focus his attention and um, focus on, on climate change. And his co-founder is an academic who uh, completed a PhD at Imperial a number of years ago, and she's now based out of a university in China. So not only the UK, but they are the, the only technology of note in direct air capture in, in China as well, despite the, the vast technological capabilities that, that they have. So they have had an amazing year. Um, David just sent me through a, a few key highlights which he, um, he wanted me to mention. So they expanded the team by over 50% this year, and it now includes over a dozen engineers. Um, they're being very, very forward-looking in terms of the technology space, so they're not only focusing on the, the core kind of direct air capture technology, but they're thinking about new materials, how they can innovate there, how they can use quantum computing, machine learning, AI, to actually innovate and come up with new materials to, to increase the disorbent capacity um, of these technologies. So they've developed that, that platform that will help accelerate material discovery, as well as fluid and thermodynamic simulation. And most significantly for them this year, they received a $1 million grant, um, which will allow them to build their first pilot plant in China early next year, and that should be operational towards the end of Q1 or Q2. So upcoming plans, um, they will launch that plant that will capture about one ton per day um, of air towards the end of Q1 2022. They'll be launching a, a fundraising round early next year. That's likely to be in the, the region of 20 to 30 million dollars, um, given the capital intensity of that space, um, but also the, the, the investor demand to actually see that technology scale up and, and develop very, very quickly. Um, they've had a lot of global interest um, from, from different countries. We've talked about China, we've talked about the UK. Um, a lot of interest from the Middle East, a lot of interest from Japan of late, and they're currently going through um, you know, analysis as to where they should go next from that perspective. And then you know, they've had a, a huge amount of support um, from a range of programs. We've been supporting them since January. They were accepted into the Tech Nation Net Zero program quite recently. They're on the, the Sword from May Fast Forward program, and they have just advanced to the, the, the second round of a climate um, air, direct air capture accelerator focused in uh, in Germany. So that's Carbon Infinity um, in, a, in a brief nutshell. Um, I haven't done as much justice as David would have done, but their, their website is up on that page, and we'd love you to go to it. Um, it's a work in progress for a new website they've recently launched, and if you could sign up for their newsletter, if you're interested in getting in touch, um, that, would be, that would be fantastic. So that's Carbon Infinity, and then the, the other team which um, was unable to join us today was the Tire Collective who we'll bring up shortly. And they, um, we have known for about two, nearly two years now. They first joined us um, on our Climate Launchpad competition, which is another program that we run for very, very early stage startups. And we support them over a, a summer and help them understand more about their, their idea and help them think about whether it justifies them starting up a business and focusing on it full time. So um, very, very intriguing idea which um, you know, I knew very little about, but was very, very obvious and eye-opening when, um, when they turned up. We have a short clip. I won't say any more for now. I'll let that clip play, and then um, let's talk about a couple of highlights that, that they've achieved.
Yeah, that was the, um, the title. Like, what you didn't see was either in demo or Carbon Infinity, the entrepreneurs themselves um, who, you know, we'd love for you to, to meet and, and get in touch with. Um, so the Tire Collective um, are founded by a team of design engineers. As you can tell by that video, they're very, very creative, as well as indeed the product that, they, that they've built. Um, but they've accelerated very, very, very quickly. Um, they've won a number of awards of late. They've had a, um, a massive amount of media attention because I think this issue of Tireware is coming more and more to the fore. Um, they won the, the, the Global Dyson Award um, very, very recently. They were featured quite extensively in the, the series of Earthshot documentaries. And they've actually just got back from Sweden um, where they were implementing a partnership that they've established between themselves, Volvo, and CV CEVT. Um, it was a major milestone to actually test that device on the roads. And they have developed a, essentially a world first outcome where they captured the first on road samples of tire wear. And interestingly enough, um, initial tests also show that they may have captured um, brake wear as well, which is not something they were, they were aiming to do but is also a very toxic um, pollutant when it comes to the atmosphere. So they will be kicking off their next phase of dev device development um, to run larger pilots towards the middle of this year, uh, middle of next year, and they will also be launching their, their next fundraising round next year as well. So um, I will stop there, and thanks again for, for everyone who's turned up. It's been um, a pleasure to see you all, and it's been amazing to, to actually see you listen to, to our startups. Um, please rem remain seated for a couple more minutes. I'm going to hand back to Raya and we are just calculating up the, the audience votes, and we will hopefully shortly announce those as well. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, thank you for getting your votes in. I think they have actually all come in and we have now calculated them, so in just a moment I'll let you know where we're at with that. But first, I'd just like to start by uh, reminding you that once we finish up here, there will be an opportunity to network with all of uh, the startups you heard from today uh, just outside. You can have some drinks and nibbles up until about half past five, so please do stick around for that. And all the startups will be allocated tables, so they should be pretty easy to find. Uh, but if you can't find who you're looking for, uh, just ask around. Members of the CCCI team will be uh, on hand to help. Right, uh, I'd now like to uh, invite the award presenters to join me uh, and presenting the third place award, the Director of Finance and Chief Operating Officer at the Royal Institution who has played an instrumental role in the partnership, uh, Michael de Crespigny. Uh, presenting the second place award uh, this afternoon, uh, Interim Director of the Centre for Climate Change Innovation, uh, Alyssa Gilbert. <laughs> and presenting the first place award, Professor Richard Templer, Director of Innovation at the Grantham Institute. Welcome back. And uh, we are, yes, just handing out the awards. So just a moment's time will be <laughs> letting you know who has uh, won what. Uh, and just uh, once again to say a huge congratulations to all of the startups involved today. And thank you to you for being here and for those of you watching uh, remotely. That just leaves me to say in third place, uh, well done to uh, the winner of the audience votes. In third place is uh, Neurosol. Please welcome them to the floor. Uh, in second place, based on audience votes this afternoon, uh, is Tree Economy. Uh, and that brings us to uh, the first place winner uh, based on audience votes. Feels very uh, Britain's Got Talent doing this, but I might just kind of give it a little bit of pause. Uh, and very well done to uh, Nanomax. Well done. Uh, thank you so much to you all for being here this afternoon. Well done to you and to everyone involved uh, this afternoon. Before you leave, please just a reminder to pledge your support via Mentimeter for any of the teams that caught your interest. And time now to uh, connect with each other and the startups. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next demo day in the summer. Thank you very much indeed and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.